Thanks, Raquel. Still have a few minutes left. Hello, Susan. Uh, thank you for joining us all the way from San Antonio. Yeah, not a, <clears throat> not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's if I can actually get my voice to work. <laughs> <laughs> Were you part of the, um, you know, I, I know your University of Saskatchewan, but uh, last year, I think the University of Alberta also did um, did a uh, thing, a webinar. Sorry about that for uh, uh, Open Week, and they showcased a platform where they had different pictures. You wouldn't know anything oh. about what you. Was that the one, was it last? I'm trying to remember where it was that a bunch of us from all over the country were part of it to talk about what we were doing in our our different areas. Um, yes, and they were using- I couldn't remember if it was Open Week or, or Intro to, uh, uh, or uh, the Open Education Conference in the fall. I, I don't remember either, yeah. but I would have <laughs> liked to get a, a hold um, what I remember from it was uh, they were using Python and when you, and these were photographs. So when you uh, hovered over the photograph, it gave you more information of, for, of the First Nation. Oh, no, I don't think that was us. That was, that was, uh, that was definitely uh, the, it sounds like the U of A, University of Alberta. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. You're welcome. Peter, where are you at? I'm going to give us one more minute. I think there's still people coming in. Okay, I, I think we're going to get going. There are, let's see, how many of you are, I don't want to move ahead yet. 
Oh, there's quite a few people here now. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to get started now. I'm Heather Ross. I'm an educational development specialist here at the Gwenamaw Center at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, when we're in Saskatoon and the background of this slide is a really nice aerial shot of our university, which is uh, an absolutely gorgeous place. I've, I've been a student at a few different institutions and uh, visited others, and I, I still think that University of Saskatchewan is one of the prettiest. Uh, to get started today, I just want to recognize that I am on uh, Treaty 6 territory today and the traditional homeland of the Métis. Um, I originally come from land that's considered sacred to the Chumash people of Southern California, and I come with respect for the land that uh, and the people uh, of this land uh, that I, we're, I'm on today, and I know that everybody is all over the place right now. Okay, let's give, let me give you an overview of what I'm going to be talking about in this hour. So we're going to talk about what are the areas of open educational practices. Um, we can look at why um, instructors, educators should be engaging in them, uh, how you can go about engaging in open educational practices, and what might that look like in your teaching. So uh, these are the areas of open educational practices. And for a lot of people who have some introduction to uh, open, uh, OER is frequently the thing that they've um, they've heard the most about. So this is things like open textbooks. And then there's open access publishing and researchers would be most familiar with this. Um, this is publishing your journal articles in a way that is uh, open to the public so that somebody can access it without having to pay for, for that access. Open data has to do with sharing your research data openly. A lot of governments will do this in certain areas, but more and more researchers uh, outside of government are doing it as well. Open teaching is about sharing your practice uh, openly so that others can benefit from it. And, and this might be in the form of, uh, of a blog or in, in a video or anything that, that people can uh, benefit from, from your own experiences. And open pedagogy, which is something that is, uh, I think, growing in popularity, certainly at our institution, and that is having students contributing to the creation or modification of uh, open learning resources so that they're contributors as opposed to just consumers of that information. Uh, if anybody has any questions along the way, if you could either, if you could put them in the Q&A, that would be great. And my colleague Raquel is here and she is going to handle uh, letting me know about those questions um, so that I can, I can answer them for you. Okay, so why open educational practices? And this is a picture of a poster, large poster that hangs in our office. Um, if you would like a digital file of this, drop me an email um, and I'm happy to share it with you. It is openly licensed. So we're gonna talk about first access. So um, open educational materials are accessible to students that for free. So this is reduced cost. Um, they can get it as a digital file for free. Our bookstore offers a print on demand service where they charge students. Uh, I think this year it's probably 15 cents a page. That's for a page of paper, a piece of paper. So that's back and front, black and white. They hole punch it, it comes out like a, a course pack that a student can put in a binder, but it's considerably che cheaper than um, buying a commercial textbook and students are free to, to print it on their own as well. Uh, um, using OER allows for access to localized content. So you can have an open resource that was created in a different country. In our case, frequently we might find materials from the US um, and then we can modify them to meet our local context. Um, it, this could be um, something as simple as modifying the language so that the spelling isn't is uses British spelling instead of um, what's used in the, in the US, um, or it can be providing new examples or um, changes if you're talking about something that's legal, changes to reference Canadian law or American law or the law in your state or province, um, you can localize that content. Um, 
And when we get into things like open pedagogy, this is an access to improved uh, academic integrity because students are creating materials um, and doing it in an authentic way so that they are less likely to be able to use materials that were created in the past. And I'll, and I'll give you an example of this. Um, it could be that students are doing something in the context of, um, in 2020, if they were doing something in the context of the pandemic, uh, they could not just pull an assignment from 2019 because the pandemic was not here yet. Um, and so if they were having to write about something or create a project around how your discipline is impacted by COVID, for example, or can be used to help deal with issues around COVID, those are things that they could not have done a year earlier. So that does help with academic integrity. Uh, the, the second thing on the poster is alignment. And so uh, I have had instructors say to me that textbook publishers have come to them and said, here's the book, now you can build your course around it. When it comes to open resources, you decide on what you want to be taught. So it will be that your materials can align with the learning outcomes that you or your department or college have decided on, um, as opposed to needing to shape them in some way around the resource. Um, you can make sure that the resource is better in alignment with your teaching values um, and also with institutional priorities. So at the U of S, um, indigenization, reconciliation, uh, sustainability, experiential learning, internationalization are all priorities here. And by using an open resource that you're modifying or creating some new open resource, you can embed those uh, institutional priorities right into it. So whether that is um, using a history book that better reflects uh, the, the history of indigenous people within your region as opposed to what commercial textbooks have, have frequently done. It can also be something as simple as, because it's an open resource, you can update it to keep it current or fix errors that were in it, which frequently you're waiting for a long time from commercial publishers to do. So again, I was talking about alignment with your outcomes and institutional priorities. Um, using open resources and open practices allows for agency for instructors to really have that control over the content that's gonna be covered in their materials or your colleges or department if it's something that's decided on collegially. Um, but it's, it is up to educators as opposed to commercial publishers deciding what is in those materials. The other thing is that it provides agency for students so that they can be contributors instead of just consumers, that they can feel like they're doing something that matters as opposed to what is often termed in, when talking about open practices as throwaway assignments where a student uh, completes an assignment and turns it in and the instructor reads it, marks it, uh, put, maybe puts some feedback on it and hands it back to the student. The student looks at the mark and frequently then throws it away. So throwaway assignment, uh, where students are creating uh, materials that can be used within communities when they're contributing to the creation of an open resource that students in the future might use, then they are more likely to be engaged because they see a greater purpose for it. Okay, so what might open educational practices look like in your teaching? All right, so this could involve you adopting an open textbook. Um, there's many, many out there, particularly for first and second year courses because those are the largest ones, uh, but there are a lot in different areas. So uh, open textbooks or other forms of OER, so it could be images or videos or music or assignments. Um, by using those instead of commercial textbooks, that can make a big difference. At our university this year alone, students are saving more than one and a half million dollars by using open instead of commercial textbooks, which is incredibly important when they're trying to decide between buying textbooks that they need for class to do well and buying groceries. Um, now, more and more commercial textbook 
publishers are also making textbooks as digital formats that students lose access to after the academic year. So students aren't really buying them, they are leasing them, renting them. And if it is their major, they lose access to it. With open, you don't have that concern. Um, it, in addition to open educational resources, there's open access publishing at the university. We have uh, an, OE, an open access repository where um, PhDs and, and uh, master's theses are also stored, but so are in re university researchers, instructors doing research. This is a place that they can put those, those articles um, where they are accessible. So if you're at an institution that has something like this, and you have a requirement from your funding agency that you publish your research openly within a year, which is what it is for, um, in Canada from our tri-council uh, agencies, um, you, don't, you don't need to pay a publisher to publish it openly. Just make sure that it is in the terms of your publishing agreement that you can put it into an open repository. And your, if your institution has one, such as we do at USASC, um, then you can put it in there and that will save you from having to spend money on publishing it openly. Uh, journal publishers, commercial journal publishers are doing what is really considered double dipping in this area because they don't make the entire issue open when they're charging people to make it open, um, which requires that institutional libraries are still having to pay for subscriptions. So they're making even more money off of um, the educational institution. Uh, open data is another one. This is uh, a page from the this is the open data page from the government of Canada, and you can go and find open data on a variety of different topics in there. Just gonna have a quick look at um, what institution, some, Kathy asked, what institutional repository do we use? Um, you know, there's a session tomorrow that is an introduction, is it tomorrow? No, sorry, Thursday. That's an introduction to our open educational, that's an introduction to our institutional repository. I'm not entirely sure what it's built on, but I want to say it might be DSpace. Um, but at that session, um, the librarian who's doing it can absolutely answer that question for you. So, um, so this is open data from the government. Sorry, from the government of Canada. Um, but there's lots of examples of this from in the U.S. and elsewhere. Okay, open teaching. As I said, it can be instructors blogging as a way of uh, sharing what their best practices are, what's going right, what's not going right even, and what they learned from those lessons. Um, or it could be sharing uh, materials that they've created on their blog and, and reflecting on it, which is also something that you can have students doing uh, because they're demonstrating that they can create the materials based on what you're learning in class, but also by having them reflect on it, you're making sure that they understand the process of that. Uh, and finally, open pedagogy is a big one. Now, this is an example of a project from USASC. Uh, there was an open textbook written by, for those of you who have some familiarity with open, written by David Wiley in the US on project management for instructional designers. And it would have been good for a, class, for a couple of classes here in our College of Education but it was very, um, the examples were all out of the US. And so the instructor decided that because the class in education was a grad course and the students were studying this very thing, um, they were going to do some authentic work and she had them uh, take this book and modify it and make it the first Canadian edition, which meant looking at the reviews that had been posted openly online of the initial open textbook, and then going and interviewing instructional designers here in Canada uh, to get Canadian perspectives and then release this updated version of the book, which is now going to be used as a textbook for um, those courses. So how can you engage in open educational practices? Let's start off with, um, before I delve into that, I'm just going to have a quick 
Ah, Kathy was just saying thank you. Uh, Raquel, if you have the link handy, can you put the link into these other sessions that are this week that people can register for? Uh, if not, I will be sure to get that into the chat near the end so that people have it. Hitting the wrong button. Sorry about that. So um, how does this work? Because how is it that people can modify materials or share them for free? Um, it happens because of open licensing. And so the way open licensing works is that if I create, if I take a photograph, for example, and I put one of these licenses on it, I do not give up my right to do as I wish with my work. I can put it in a book, I can sell it, I can make posters out of it, I can do anything I want with my work. What these licenses allow me to do is to give explicit permission to somebody, to the public, not just an individual, but the public to do certain things with that piece of work. So when we're talking about the, the public domain, things that are in the public domain happen in a couple of ways. One is when copyright expires, uh, an item goes into the public domain and can be used um, without attribution um, and can be adapted. Now, legally you can do that, but you wanna think about the ethics behind it and not try and pass off Shakespeare, for example, as your own work, um, just because the, the original, not the stuff that has been packaged into say a book by uh, Pearson, for example, commercial publishing. Um, the original, you can do what you wish with, but think about the ethics of it before you try and pass it off. Um, as your own work. You wanna make sure that you are still um, providing credit where credit is due um, because it's also helpful for others if they're going to build on that to know what the original source was. And then the licenses actually become more restrictive as we move down this list. And so you always have to, and except for the public domain one, you have to give attribution. So you have to say what the source of it was. This does not need to be like an APA format or anything. It can be um, a link back to the page where you got it from if it was um, if it was online. Um, it doesn't have it doesn't have to be that formal, but you should indicate where you got it from and what the original license was if possible. And it would have one of these licenses on it if you can do that. If something does not have one of these licenses, even if it does not have a copyright symbol, it is copyrighted by default. So if you find something on the web and you wanna use it and it does not have one of these licenses, you have to consider that copyrighted. So you can't just do as you wish with something you find online. Um, the, so, Attribution is required in all of these. This, uh, the third one down, the symbol uh, that says SA means share alike. That means that you need to put the same license on it if you are modifying somebody else's work from before. Um, the non-commercial means not you cannot make a profit. So our bookstore offers the print on demand service. They do not make a profit off of it. They charge cost. And they actually have the printing done through our um, uh, print center on campus that is owned by the Undergraduate Student Association. So when students pay to have their open textbooks printed, the money, if there is any money, um, it's unlikely that money profit is made because of the, the setup of it, but the money goes back to the students. Um, the next one down is just a combination of those. And then we get into ones that have this equal sign on them with the ND, and that means no derivatives. So you can share this as much as you want. You can um, post it openly. You can photocopy it and hand it out, hand it out to as many students as you want. Um, you cannot change it. And in most cases, we don't consider this to be an open resource if it has that license, except when we get into more sensitive cultural materials. So when we're talking about getting, uh, interviewing uh, First Nations people to get uh, stories about their experiences, not traditional knowledge, 
but them telling stories about when they were growing up. It would still be considered an open resource, even with a non-derivative license on it, in those cases. If you're dealing with traditional knowledge, you have to keep in mind that, and I know I'm speaking from the perspective of people um, in this area, so people who are Cree and, and um, Soto and Nakoda and so forth, in this area, um, traditional, law, traditional knowledge cannot be copyrighted because it doesn't belong to one person. It belongs to the, to the entire people, the community, um, and is considered sacred. And so it, it can't be copyrighted. And if something can't be copyrighted, it can't be openly licensed either. So you really want to make sure that when you start getting into information that might be either culturally sensitive or um, might be something that, hey, wait, this can't be, this falls outside of the way uh, Western society thinks about copyright. And you need to be aware of, of uh, the issues that would be around that for use in an open resource. Okay, so um, if you're at, if you're at the University of Saskatchewan, I can absolutely speak to this, but really if you're at any institution that uses something called Pressbooks, which is an open textbook platform, um, then that you can make use of that when you're creating open materials. So it is used by, I, I saw a number of registrants, number of registrants were actually coming from um, Manitoba. And you have press books access in Manitoba and BC in uh, Alberta and Ontario and so forth. And I know that a number of places in the US use it as well. Um, it is an open source tool. It is built on top of WordPress. So if you're familiar with the WordPress blogging platform, then Pressbooks is going to come easy for you. Um, that's if you want to create or modify materials. If you're just looking to see what materials are available, um, maybe you want to use a book that exists as is, um, there's a number of repositories out there. And again, um, I would recommend to get started. Um, we have a brand new site set up that is open.usask.ca that will take you to not only our repository, which is shown here for open textbooks, but will link you to additional ones. And I see something in the chat. Thanks, Raquel. Uh, absolutely, the open.usas.ca. And you can get to this open press, press site. Um, it's openpress.usask. Um, I think just .ca as well. Um, but you can go through our open.usas site and get here. And these are four, four books that we, uh, we have in our repository. We now have 31 uh, as of last week. I can tell you that the two on either end were actually chosen last year as among the top books in the entire Pressbooks network. So that would be at any, for anybody using Pressbooks, the, um, the, Everybody who works at Pressbooks decided on what the top ones were. They each made lists and um, the lymphatic system of the dog and effective professional communication um, made at least one list. I think one of them made uh, two lists from Pressbooks. All right, um, so you saw, sorry, you saw a look at our repository, our, our Pressbooks. But we are not the only place that you can get them. And again, if you go to open.usas, there are links to these. Uh, there's BC Campus's open collection. The, there is the one from LibreText, which is out of uh, UC Davis in California. And then any book that is in Pressbooks, where it's on the Pressbooks network hosted by Pressbooks, every public book in there you can find through the Pressbooks directory. And again, you can find these all through our website. Um, so I showed you this picture before of the repository. Recently, in addition to putting open access articles and, and theses into the repository, um, we now have it set up so that we can add other open educational resources. 
So uh, text, uh, our books are going on press books, but there's ancillary resources, PowerPoints, uh, for example, or handouts that people want to share openly, they can now put them into our OER repository. Um, in addition, if you have students doing open pedagogy work, uh, so creating anything that's going to be shared openly, then that can be added to the repository by instructors as well at USASC. Um, and this could be students doing poster sessions for undergraduate research projects. Um, those posters, instead of just being printed and then rolled up and never to be seen again, um, they can be shared through the repository so that people can continue to access them. And it looks like that um, Raquel is leaving quite a few links in the chat that will be useful for people, including um, the link to some sessions that are still to come this week about the repository um, and some additional information. So I wanna talk about supports. Now, again, I'm coming from the University of Saskatchewan perspective, but some of these will be the same at your institution in terms of the type of units. So I work at the Teaching and Learning Center. If your institution has a Teaching and Learning Center, uh, they might be able to assist you if you're looking to do some work around open educational practices. Uh, the Distance Education Unit is another place. Um, so the people who deal in, in distance education might be able to assist you with that. At many institutions, however, the library actually leads this initiative. And so your librarians might be very useful in helping you to find open educational materials and also talk to you about what other supports might be available through your institution. Uh, we have some funding that we can provide to support uh, OER and open pedagogy projects. Um, and if you are at USAS, just contact me and I am happy to help you with that. But you could also look into your institutions to find out if they have funding or if there are um, other bodies within the province or state that might be able to assist you with that. So I want to talk about what's next. It's good timing. Um, I'm going to talk about what's next. So um, there are, I'm just going to do a quick check here. I can see sometimes Zoom cooperates and sometimes it does not. It's just, ah, oh, there we go. So looks like there's 19 participants in here, which is great. I'm very happy about that. Um, so what I'd like is either in the chat or if you can raise your hand. Um, I want to know what is one way that you can engage in at least one of these practices and what would be your next step? So not, you, you might come up with, well, yeah, I think I could do open pedagogy in my class. Great, what's the first thing you're going to do? And that might be something as, I'm gonna talk to somebody at my teaching and learning center, or I'm gonna go look at, we, we have a website for this, I'm gonna go look at that. I wanna hear of, all these different areas, so open educational resources, open access publishing, open data, open teaching, and open pedagogy. Um, what is something that you think you could be doing in your teaching and learning? And what is going to be your next step? And I see that Alec Aiken has his hand up. So Alec here from the University of Saskatchewan, go ahead. Yeah, Heather, you and I have already had this discussion, but yeah, we're we're at risk of losing some really valuable pedagogy that's based on first person narrative with indigenous uh, nations that relates to Northern studies. And it's just, it's harder and harder to deliver these courses from uh, from people in classrooms that have tenure track jobs. And I'd like to make sure that we preserve that. So you and I are gonna discuss in about a week's time how we're gonna move some of these materials into OER so it becomes freely available to the company, to the community. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And Alec, I think that that's a great project. Um, when we're talking about work um, that's coming out of communities, First Nations communities or works that's been done with them, uh, historically, post-secondary institutions have simply, researchers have gone in and, and studied people in these communities or gotten stories from people in these communities and used them any way they wanted. 
um, with the communities never benefiting from it. And when we do this kind of work and then we share it back with communities in an open way, um, that then they have those materials and they can do as they wish with them. Um, when we have an open textbook come out, it, somebody in another community, one of the things you can do with modifying it is putting it in, translating it into another language. So if we have materials here, then they can be modified for use within Northern communities, for example, and they can be translated into Cree or any other language for the community, the local community. So uh, let's let's see some more hands going up. I want to hear from people about what's one thing you think you might be able to do uh, at your institution. And if you don't know what that next one step is, that's okay. Tell me the uh, the thing you're thinking about doing, and maybe I can help you figure out what that first step is going to be. Uh, I see Shaylin Kress, uh, a graduate student and have been a teaching assistant. I hope to teach a course soon. One way I can engage is by continuing to prioritize open access and open data in my research. My next step will be to look at what open educational resources are available once I know what course I will get to teach. So what is the discipline that you are a graduate student in, Shaylin? Hi, I am in the psychology department at the University of Saskatchewan, and I uh, specialize in cognitive neuroscience. Excellent. So there are three open textbooks currently used in the Department of Psychology here at USASC. There is a the first year one that Jordan Cummings did that marvelous adaptation for, and I know is used not only here, but at other institutions. She also did the abnormal psychology one. That is being used and then there is the one on statistics for uh, researchers in psychology but there's other psychology books out there so when you know what course it is just drop me an email and i will help you find out what's available thank you you're welcome uh who else is going to let's see how uh, promote OER to the faculty for which I am a liaison librarian for. Excellent. I'm going to arrange this with the librarian who is heading this initiative at the University of Manitoba. How that is wonderful. Um, if there is anything that I can do to help you um, with sharing information, um, all my presentations like this and so forth, I openly license. So if anybody needs anything, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. And I am happy to provide you with whatever support I can. Uh, Hal, you now your hands up. So go ahead, Hal. Yeah, I was wondering, do you have any examples of initiatives uh, across campuses or different institutions? It seems to me like creating some of these things could be a lot of work, but if it's a joint effort or different, Similar programs across different universities might be one way to tackle it. For creating these? Yeah. So um, there's a book that was on that one of the slides earlier. I will let's see. Can I go back? Yeah. So Digging into Canadian Soils. Uh, this book is actually a cross-Canada collaboration with more than 40 contributors to it. Um, it was headed up with by... Fran Wally here at the University of Saskatchewan and Maja from, uh, I'm going to absolutely butcher her name, but Maja Krizik from uh, UBC. And absolutely, there's, there's lots of examples of projects like this. Our first year engineering program went through a complete rehaul and a lot of the materials, the open materials that they're using were uh, created in collaboration with, also with, um, institutions in British Columbia. So yes, there is there is a great deal of cross institution and uh, cross province and cross state collaborations going on. And again, uh, if there's a particular area, uh, discipline area that you're that you'd be interested in, uh, let me know and perhaps I know of projects that are either going on or some interest that might be from here 
to do a project like that. There's been some great ideas already shared. Um, who else would like to step out and uh, share what their, their thoughts are on this? I'm gonna get back to that slide. So it could be in any of these areas, but I'd love to hear from you. I know that Raquel put a link in the chat um, to the other sessions going on this week. And I will tell you that tomorrow there is one. Um, the target audience is, is people at the University of Saskatchewan, but it is open to others. And it's an introduction to using press books. On Wednesday, we have a panel session in the morning um, where um, there will be three people on the panel and as well as a, um, a facilitator, but they're gonna be talking about how to integrate open educational practices in a way that helps to advance institutional priorities. Um, in this case, the priorities are indigenization, uh, sustainability and universal design. And I think that'll be a, a very interesting session as well. And then on Thursday, we have a session on that's an introduction to our new uh, OER repository, which I also think um, should be quite interesting. So uh, let's see, information literacy skills in OER. So this is an area that you're interested in, Susan. Yes, so are you asking for materials that are on information literacy skills that are openly licensed, or are you interested in um, uh, the importance of information literacy skills when students are working on OER or faculty for that matter? Both. Okay, yes, information literacy is incredibly important when you are working with open. Um, one part of that being copyright, that is an important uh, aspect of this. Uh, if you have students or, again, instructors pulling together materials from other places, um, it is important that they understand how to determine what is a reliable source, which is an, another key part of information literacy. Um, so where getting, you're getting information from. Um, there's the technical side as well. So can students or instructors uh, use the whatever techno technological platforms are going to be needed for some of this work, such as Pressbooks or WordPress, or um, how to upload materials into the repository. Um, so yes, there's lots of aspects of, of information literacy that are important for use for when you're using OER or creating OER, adapting OER. Uh, information literacy skills in terms of resources that are already open. Uh, there, I would, let's see, I would Google, I'm trying to remember, it is Caulfield. What is, what is his first name? Maybe Michael. Um, he's, if you, if you, um, if you Google uh, digital literacy all field, you're probably going to find them. But I know that he has some open resources for working with students in K to 12. I believe K to 12, but they, if they are, they can be modified. Absolutely. Um, that you might find useful. But I, I, I think that if you looked around in some of the, the OER repositories, you might find some other materials. Um, how is OER vetted? Okay. This is a good one. So um, if you're looking for stuff that is created outside of your institution, um, so you don't know who the instructors are, maybe who worked on something, um, there, I, I, I usually send people, especially in Canada, to the BC campus site because they do a really good job of vetting material. They look at things and they make sure there's not any copyright concerns and so forth. 
before something gets added to their list. They also have um, some really great, um, they have a really great rubric that they use for um, the evaluation of materials. One of the things about open resources compared to commercial um, is when something gets published openly, then uh, it creates a broader audience. So it's more people's eyes are on it and having a look at this and determining the, the, the level of the quality and accuracy and um, wording, everything. Um, and people post those reviews openly. Um, if I know you're in Texas, but for those of you in Western Canada, if you apply to review a book for BC campus, they actually, I think, give you $200 still to do that. And then they publish it on their website with the books. Um, I know that you are, Susan, you're in San Antonio. So the, the big thing there is OpenStax out of Rice University. Um, and I know that that they put a lot of a lot of work into making sure that of the quality of those books. Um, but you can look at like, yeah, kind of like Yelp, except that the with BC campus, they don't just let anybody's review gets public get published. You have to prove that you teach that course. So it can't be that somebody's paying their buddies to go and put certain reviews up. Um, it is it is um, more professional than that. I hope that helps. But again, BC campus, I would look at the their page on reviewing books because you're going to be able to find their rubric there. Um, looking at rubrics for anytime you're evaluating course materials would be important. I mean, if you have a if you are if you have access to an open textbook and a commercial publisher sends you a commercial textbook, the only thing you have is um, the word of the commercial textbook publisher, or you reading it, or the open textbook and you reading that. Um, we, I've had a lot of people ask me about research showing um, the usefulness of open educational resources. And it's actually been done because we've gotten the question so many times that people in, who work in open have been doing research now for a few years around this and showing not only the uh, the usefulness of it, um, but we've shown that students are more likely to complete courses because they have access to the learning materials they can afford. Um, but an important question is, um, there has actually not been research done on showing the efficacy of commercial textbooks, but we get a lot of questions about the efficacy of OER. So um, it's something to consider. Um, however you screen, commercial textbooks, I would, I would hold uh, open resources up to, to the exact same standard. And if you are going to use those rubrics to look at open resources, the next time you're looking at commercial, use the same rubrics and see if the, those materials are, are meeting your standards as well. Yes, absolutely. Students have access to everything before class begins. You don't have to worry about a publisher, whether the, the bookstore has gotten something in or whether a student can afford to buy a book or buy the access code for something. Um, and they don't have to give their um, their credit card information to publishers. Um, they can just download these materials for free. And not just students, anybody in communities can access these because they are publicly available. I see something in the Q&A. This is anonymous participant. <laughs> Some of the open press textbooks are CC by NCSA. So um, attribution required, non-commercial, share alike. Is it okay for an open textbook to be non-commercial if it is used in a course where students pay tuition? Yes. Yes, it is. Because students are not paying for the book. They are paying for the expertise of the instructor. And I hate to say it, but the credentialing is part of that. Um, but they're not paying for the book. And if they buy the book, if they buy a printed version of the book um, from, I know from our bookstore, um, because they don't make a profit on it, it does, it's fine to have an NC license. 
So I, I hope that answers your question. Just checking the time. We still have about 15 minutes left. So anybody else who has any questions or comments related to what their, their interest area is, uh, what they can be doing next, please um, chat, Q&A, raise your hand, any of those will do. Um, I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to offer you whatever support I can in the next few minutes. Uh, here's a question. Oop, two questions in the Q and A. Uh, open teaching, instructor sharing materials. That's part of it. It is also sharing your experience. So if you have created um, a handout, for example, and you want to share it publicly, openly, um, say on your blog or in some other way. Um, it isn't just sharing the resource, but it's sharing your reflection on, okay, this is how I used it. This is what went well. Um, this is how I might do things differently in the future. That's all part of open teaching. So it, it is sharing not just an, an artifact, but how you use the artifact and how that went and what was your learning from the experience. So when we talk about open teaching, it's also a little bit of open learning because it is is what what has the instructor been learning as part of this process? So I hope that answers that question for you, Shaylin. Um, and you also asked about open pedagogy equals students contributing to materials. If open pedagogy are students often graded on their ability to contribute. Ah, that's an excellent question. So there's a few ways that you can mark students when it comes to open pedagogy. One is if you, let's say we have students contributing to an open textbook or creating uh, posters for poster sessions or creating other materials that could be, might be used in the community. Think about, you might, um, you might create a rubric that you use to, uh, you would use as if they were handing those assignments in in class and mark them the same way you would as if it was just a throwaway assignment. That's one way. The other thing is marking on reflection. So we have an instructor here at USASC who teaches in agriculture. And in one of her classes, she gives a final examination that is not a bunch of questions where students are regurgitating what they've learned or multiple choice or something along those lines, but rather it is a reflective paper. And it is simply questions about what did you learn? And the rubric is phrased in first person. So it is, what did I learn? And how will it apply to what I am planning to do or my life now? And it's a reflection that the students write. And I, I questioned, I thought this was an interesting idea, but then she said she had never seen better evidence of learning because students were not just circling an answer or um, putting down exactly what they'd already been told, they had to actually explain how they would use it and what they're learning, what they got out of it. Um, so if you did that around an open pedagogy project about what did you learn from this experience? And again, you can give, give students a, um, a rubric that would be useful. Uh, Raquel, if you can, maybe jump over to our blog just do a quick search for um, reflection and there'll be a post there that has the rubric right in it. That would be great. Um, and so getting students to um, reflect, not only does that give you something to grade, but it actually will, the research shows that it will help students retain that information when you have them do reflections like that. Um, yeah, absolutely, Kathy. That's great. So she's used open pedagogy in a similar way in the future, in the past, I mean, um, and students come up with this is they're talking about what they would do differently in the future, what more they want to know. 
Um, so it's not just about what they've already done. It's about what they're going to do moving forward. And I love that. Thanks so much for sharing that, Kev. Anything else? I'm watching for where questions are coming up in the Q&A and the chat. And again, you can raise your hand if you want. Kathy, go ahead. I have a question. Sorry if there's you can hear a siren. Um, so with your harvest, your um your institutional repository. So it's necessary to have both a press books account, someplace where you're creating the digital um open resource as well as the place where you're going to save that resource? No, um, books that are created in Pressbooks stay in Pressbooks. Things that go in our, our other repository are things that aren't books. So if, a, if you create a book in Pressbooks, it just stays in Pressbooks and it can be accessed by anybody. And it can actually be anybody else who has Pressbooks can actually just grab the link to that book and clone it right onto their own instance of Pressbooks to make a different version of it. So it, that's quite handy. Um, but I want to I want to emphasize something. So especially for places that maybe you don't have any of this, you don't have press books, you don't have an open educational repository, you've got nothing. If you are creating, if you create a book, say a book type artifact, create it in Word or have it in Word, post it on an open site somewhere with a license as a Word document, and as a PDF document, PDF is going to be easier for the printing purposes. It's going to hold its format. The Word document allows people to modify it. Um, you can put something into Google Drive and create a folder that you share publicly or something for other materials or to put those that Word in PDF. Don't let the technology be a barrier is what I'm saying. So if you do not have those tools at your disposal use the ones you have because it's more important that people have access to these than that you get it into press books so it looks like a book in a certain way um the most the, the key thing is access you want students to be able to have access and by putting the word document up you've got a version that people can download and modify to meet those local needs does that help yeah, that's exactly where we are. Um, I just spearheaded getting um, a whole new library team that um, our goal is to get an institutional repository, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, move more in open because everything, including our library, is um, closed off. It's not, nothing's available. So we're in the process of turning our library pages um, open facing um, because we used a third party and I know this is very rare, but we used a third party to host our library for many, many years because <laughs> we're a totally um, remote, um, all, um, all digital campus. And so it's just been the way it has been for over 25 years. So now we're in the process of moving open. And what institution are you at? Excelsior University. Which it's is in where? The States. It's in Albany, New York. So um, you might reach out to um, is it City, Uni City University of New York, CUNY and SUNY, because they're doing a lot of stuff with open. And they might be able to give you some advice. Yeah, actually, SUNY, uh, SUNY Albany is like literally down the street from us. And yeah. I've tried that before. Um, I should give a shout out to Alex Poros because I have um, I've been in his MOOC many, many years ago, and he's helped me link up with people like Clint Lalonde and 
you know, Amanda from BC campus yeah. and different people. So I've been trying to move this initiative um, for a long time. So um, yep. they've been very helpful along the way, but I'm just now getting into the point where I got to have people um, start working in the open and I need right. to get the tools together. So yeah, it, it doesn't have to be fancy. You just need to get the ball rolling. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sorry for all You're the welcome. questions. Oh, no, no, it's fine. I'm happy to help. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left. These have been some wonderful questions and ideas that you've been throwing out there. Um, I'm so grateful for all of you who have come today. Uh, we could probably take one more. Um, I'm also going to put into the chat. Uh, this is my email. So feel free, drop me an email if you have further questions, if um, you need some advice about um, um, how, how certain things in open work. Um, I can also, because I've been doing this work for a number of years, I can also probably connect you with people in your province or state um, who might be able to, to help you out as well. Uh, Susan. <clears throat> Excuse me again. How do we get a re uh, a copy of this recording? Um, we're going to post it, I believe, on our YouTube channel. Thank you. You're welcome. And I would find it underneath University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Gwena Moss Center for Teaching and Learning. Moss Center for Teaching and Learning. That also makes sense, too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. OK. Well, I want to thank everybody again for giving me your time. I hope that you found it useful. Um, and again, my email is in the chat. So, and Raquel, thank you for sharing all those those links about grading. Reflection was the one. Um, she also shared the link to the sessions that we have to register for the sessions we have coming up later in the week, um, and a few other handy resources so um ah and there's the link to our youtube channel you're awesome uh thank you so much to everybody um and that that's that's it for for today so please uh have a have a good evening wherever you are rest of your day um and thank you again <laughs>